long ago when things like this morning would have drove me crazy. Uh, little technical difficulties, things going wrong. Some of you don't even know what they are. I know what every one of them is, I guarantee you. Uh, because I've been doing this so long, every bit of it bothers me to some degree. And used to, it would have just ate my lunch. I'm going to tell you that right now. And it's not too much that it gets to eat my lunch. So because, uh, but I was sitting down there and I just started kind of laughing to myself. And I said, I said to myself, well, I actually said to Satan, Satan, you're about to get your tail in whipped. Because God's wanting to do some things and you're trying to interrupt. But let me tell you, God's a greater God than Satan will ever be. And uh, matter of fact, today we need to find out and we need to figure out. Uh, Corey, let me ask you, are you coming back for the invitation? Or are you? Yeah. All right. We had, we've been talking about doing something different. I was making sure I knew what was going on at the end because Lord knows I'm not in control of anything. So, but I just want to say that today is a day that you and I need to truly, truly listen to the Spirit of God in our hearts and lives. We're going to be looking at a passage of scriptures in just a minute. And, and I want to tell you what's happening before that. Matter of fact, Jesus has just called Matthew the tax collector. He called him from the tax collection table. Matthew's a thief. All right? Matthew steals money. Matthew is one of those that takes money for himself. And he's, he's like working for the IRS. And so Jesus calls him. He gets up and leaves and follows Jesus. And then Jesus goes with him and eats with a bunch of tax collectors. And the spiritual people, the churchy people, come to Jesus and say, what in the world are you doing eating with this scum of the earth bunch? Now, that ought to make you think. Let me tell you something, folks. Jesus doesn't look at what you and I look at. There have been people that have been helped this week that you, and you will never know about because it's none of your business, but they're in need, and we got staff members and others that are helping all the time in that, and I praise God for their hearts in that. I praise God somebody else gets to do it because I used to do it a lot. There's a lot of things going on with people and families and homes that you may never know about. But I can tell you this, there's people doing God's work. And some of us will look at those people and say, why are you doing it? Let me tell you, the reason is because they're a child that is either lost and going to hell or they're a child that knows Jesus but just going through some bad times. Either way, they need to be brought closer to God and the things of God. I've been members of a lot of critical churches and pastored a lot of critical churches in my life. I grew up in a Hard shell, stiff neck, Southern Baptist Church. I want to tell you something. I don't like them. It messed me up. And God had to work on me for years to get that out of my system. So we go on before this passage here. and they, uh, Here's John the Baptist. Disciples come to Jesus and say, Well, how come your disciples, how come they don't fast? like the rest of us and the Pharisees do. And Jesus kind of gave him a couple examples there. He said, when there's a wedding and celebration, do they mourn for the groom? But later on, the groom's going to be gone. See, back in that day, when you got married, you had responsibilities. And you didn't get to play around with all your friends anymore. You had to take care of the responsibilities at home. All right? I personally think it still should be that way. So, he said, no, you have time for that later on. He also said, now listen, they didn't have a lot of clothes like you and I have. I had to build my own closet in our house so I could put my clothes someplace. Whatever. <laughs> it's true. I did build my own closet in our house, and it's my closet. And my wife could not wait to get my junk out of our closet. See, she's shaking her head. Yes, there, so there. You get half of it anyway. So anyway, we live in a day today when we got clothes running on our ears. I mean, if you got more than two or three sets of clothes, you're, you're better off than they were in biblical days. So Jesus told them, nobody takes new patches and patches over old clothes. And I know you do it today. That's the style. 
But he said the reason for that is, is that that new patch will shrink and it will tear the old clothes. You see, their old clothes were old. We're talking about they wore them all the time. They wore them until they wore out. Then Jesus also says, and make me make sure, let me make sure because I don't, my mind's not totally clear today, so I'm going to look back to make sure I give you the right one. Yes. Then he says to them, you don't put new wine in an old wine skin. The reason is the new wine expands and the old wine, wine skin cannot contain it. Now, I'm sorry, Baptists, I just mentioned wine in church. And most of us Baptists are teetotalers, but some of you are just whiners. And so, there's a, you don't put new wine in old wine skins because they'll break out. You see, new wine gets put in new wine skins. And let me tell you about this one. That's something that you and I need to get right. You don't put new wine, the things of God, in an old body that is not new for Him. It won't work. It can't hold it. But let me tell you, when you let God make everything new in you and I, then new wine can be put in, and then you and I can be new from the inside out. Now I'm going to get to the scripture so I can preach. Hey, after all that, I just realized my screen's working. Hallelujah. I'm just bad as preacher said hallelujah in church. I must be Pentecostal. All right. In verse 18 of Matthew chapter 9, we find as Jesus was saying this, what I just talked about, okay, the leaders of the uh, leader of the synagogue came and knelt before him. He understood who Jesus was. He came and knelt before him. A leader of the synagogue. This was kind of unusual. Now, I want to also say, though, many times until you and I have a need in our lives, we will not kneel before a holy God. But unfortunately, we forget about some of the things that God's done in our lives, and we don't kneel before a holy God on a regular basis. And, and cry out to Almighty God. So he kneels before him. He says, my daughter has just died. He said, but you can bring her back to life again if you just come and lay your hand on her. This is about faith. You and I, God desires a faith relationship with you. He desires a faith relationship with me. He desires a faith relationship because God cannot do the things in our life unless you and I have the faith it takes to believe in Him that He'll do what He says He will do. And I know this looks dumb, but I've been losing weight and I'm going to lose my pants in front of all of you if I don't put my belt a little tighter. And that's embarrassing. It's not like it hasn't happened before. So, I'm not going to get into that one. My wife did look at me and smile. She remembers. Uh, verse 19 says, So Jesus and his disciples got up and went with him. Now, verse 20 says, Just then a woman who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding came up behind him, and she touched the fringe of his robe. Oh, my goodness. Here's a man whose daughter has died. He comes to Jesus because he knows that Jesus can raise her from the dead. I want to tell you something. Jesus can, Jesus can raise your spiritually dead body today from the dead. Now a woman comes up behind him, just touches. She probably couldn't get to him from all the people, and she's probably weak. She's been bleeding for 12 years. I've got to think in my mind, she just thought if I could just touch, and there's been a lot of songs written about it, the hem or fringe of his garment, I could be healed. The problem is you and I today don't feel like we need to reach out and touch the hem of God's garment. 
What we need to realize is that you and I always need God in our lives. You and I always need Him to touch us. You and I always need His healing, either physically, physically, or any other way. Verse 21 says, For she thought, if I can just touch his robe, I'll be healed. In verse 22, Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be encouraged. Now listen, a lot of us would say, right now, we'd stop right then. What are you talking about being encouraged? I've had this problem for 12 years. I am not encouraged. I'm sick. I've had this going on for 12 years. I can't get over it. I can't do it. I want to tell you we're living in a world of can't doers instead of a world that God can do all things and anything. You see, the problem is here, she says, I just felt I touched you. That's all it would take. I want to tell you many of us are waiting for a hand of God or a touch from God whenever you and I aren't going close to God, close enough to touch Him. What do you mean by that, preacher? I mean you're not spending enough time with God. You're not spending enough time in the Bible. We're not spending enough time on our knees. We're not realizing what we need in our lives is Jesus more than everything else. I want to just say, just a matter of fact, early this morning, I read, a, read this little thing. And it said that Ships don't sink, some of you have seen this, from the water that surrounds them. Ships sink when the water gets inside of them. You see, the way you and I sink, we keep letting the outside world get inside of us. And if you and I would quit letting the outside world affect who we are and letting Jesus Christ himself affect who we are, you and I would see what God can do and not what everybody else says can be done. He said, daughter, be encouraged. Listen to this. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. We're living with a bunch of doubters today. Oh, I know God can do all things. I just hope he will. Oh, I know that God can change me. I know that God can heal me. I know that God can fix what's going on in my life. If he chooses to. Man, I want to tell you, this lady said, I'm going to get to him no matter what it takes I'm going to get through that crowd. No matter how weak I am, I'm going to touch the hem of his garment. And I know if I do, he's going to heal me. Folks, that's faith. You and I need that kind of faith again that we can see the hand of God working in a way that he can work in our lives and will if you and I quit being faithless and start having faith in God. And the woman was healed at that moment. We go on, verse 23 says, When Jesus arrived at the official's home, he was on the way to go to this little girl. I would imagine that guy was saying, Would you hurry up? My daughter's dead. You know, if that was me, I'd say, Hey, this is an urgent thing. My daughter's dead. The rest of these people don't have this problem. That's my problem. You don't understand. My daughter's dead. You're supposed to be getting there. And Jesus now stops to talk to this lady. I could imagine if that would have been me. I'd have been going to say, come on, come on. You don't understand. My daughter's dead. You can make her alive, but you got to get there. Folks, I want to tell you something. You and I need to leave, leave the timing to God. Some of the problems with some of us, Satan has told you, that means it's never going to happen. That is not true. What you got to do is give it to God every day, every moment of every day. So when Jesus arrived at the official's home, he saw the noisy crowd and heard the funeral music. Maybe that was a Baptist church. No, I'm just kidding. In verse 24, he said, get out, he told them. <laughs> now, can you imagine how that went over? Here they are mourning at a funeral for a child that's dead. And he tells everybody to get out of here. 
He said, the little girl isn't dead. Now they're all thinking, well, hmm, that's funny. We've all seen her. We've all been here. We've looked at her. A couple of them are thinking, man, I felt there was no pulse. Some of the other ones said, she's already kind of turning white. and She's dead. He said, get out of here. She's not dead. She's only asleep. But the crowd laughed at him. I want to tell you, when Jesus is getting ready to do a great work, the world will always laugh at God. That's because they don't know him. That's because they don't know what he's getting ready to do and what he can do and is capable and able to do in our lives. We go on, and it says, After the crowd was put outside, however, Jesus went in and took the girl by the hand, took her by the hand, and she stood up. That's the power of Almighty God. You see, the problem is we don't think God's got any power anymore. It's not that God doesn't have any power anymore. We don't have, safe, uh, we don't have faith enough to see his power at work. When you and I have that faith relationship with God, we will see what God can do. We were at a Bible study a couple of weeks ago, and, and God's been working on Deb and I on the same thing. And, and we were giving a little testimony there, and Deb said, I want to see God work the way he used to work in our life. And I've been, God's been bringing me to that same place again. But it came to me, the reason I haven't seen the miracles that God has done in our lives very much is that I've quit trusting him for those miracles. I quit looking for those miracles. I quit praying for the things that were impossible to see what God could do, and I've been listening to what people can do instead of Almighty God. We go on. Verse 26 says, The report of this miracle swept through the entire countryside. And after Jesus left the girl's house, two blind men followed along behind him shouting. That's pretty cool when blind men are chasing you down. I mean, I'm just thinking, you know, that's a rough one there. So uh, he, he said, he's going on down. These two blind men are shouting out, Son of David, have mercy on us. They went right into the house where he was standing, and Jesus asked them, listen to this, do you believe I can make you see? They're blind men now. They haven't been to all the eye doctors. They haven't been to all the specialists. There was none. Their hope is in Jesus and Jesus alone. And your and my hope is in Jesus and Jesus alone. He can make the blind to see. He can raise the dead from the grave. He can surely give you spiritual sight if you and I will allow him to. He said, do you believe I can make you see? Yes, Lord, they told him, we do. Let me tell you, they didn't put that little wavering thing in there either. Yeah, Lord, we believe you can make us see if you want to, but if you don't want to, we'll understand. No, we believe that you can make us see. I believe that you can make Now, listen, Satan's going to make you think right now, well, listen, you prayed to be healed, and you weren't healed. Therefore, listen, I don't tell you, I'm not telling you it's 100%, but I want to tell you, if you don't have enough faith to trust God in it, it will never happen. I don't know what God's going to do and he's not going to do. He's God, but I will tell you this. I'll trust whatever he does as long as I know I've done what I'm supposed to do for him. Then he touched their eyes and said, listen again, because of your faith, it will happen. Because of their faith. What you and I are lacking today is faith like this in an almighty God. God is not changed. God's word says he'll always the same yesterday, today, and forever. His ear has not got heavy. His arms have not shortened. My God can do anything that he's ever done throughout history. 
Then their eyes were opened and they could see Jesus. And Jesus sternly warned them. Don't tell anybody about this. I'm going to show you something here now. They're getting ready to disobey Jesus. And I have to tell you, in this case, I can't blame them. And let me tell you why. Because surely when Jesus really does something in your life that nobody else could ever do, you're not going to be able to shut up about it. You know the reason there's so many of us that aren't telling other people what God has done? Because God can't do anything in us because we haven't shown our faith to him so he can. And there's some of us today that we've seen the hand of God, we've seen miracles of God, we're living miracles of God, and we're forgetting about it, and we're not living it and telling it so everybody else knows what God has done. You see, the church would come alive if people would start praising Him for what He has done, and other people would see it, and they would say, God, I know what you're doing in not only my life, but the lives of others. I heard about a church that's not real far from here. Just this last week, I went to lunch with the pastor there. He said he didn't get to preach last Sunday. Said, matter of fact, he kind of apologized to the church because they had somebody want to give a short testimony, and they did, and then everybody else, God started working in their heart, and the Holy Spirit started moving, and people started telling what Jesus had done for their lives, and he didn't get a chance to preach, and it was a longer service than usual. Man, I miss those days, and we've seen a lot of them. I want to tell you what happens around most churches anymore. We sit on our tail ends, and we don't want to tell anybody what Jesus does, but we want to sing standing on the promises of God, sitting on the premises. I was wanting to say something else there, and some of you are getting ready for it. The truth of the matter is, folks, we need to become alive in Christ so that other people might see Christ in and through us. We need to let the hand of God touch our lives in a way that only God can touch our lives. And there's a lot of people going through a lot of junk that we don't know about. You don't have to know all the junk. All you've got to do is say, I'm praying for you. And all they have to do is say, I'm going to trust God through this if it kills me. Let me tell you, I'm going to trust God through things even if it kills me because if it takes me home, praise God, I'm in heaven with him. What in the world are we afraid of? Oh, pastor, you haven't been through stuff. Let me tell you something. You don't want to get in that contest. I'll just tell you right now, I've been through stuff. We've been through stuff that nobody wants to go through, and I wouldn't want my worst enemy to see. But I want to tell you, God has taken us through everything that's ever happened in our lives. And God will take you through whatever happens in your life if you'll just have faith enough in him. Verse 31 says, but instead they went out and spread his fame all over the region. They couldn't, you can't help but tell people what Jesus did when Jesus really does something in your life. You can't help but tell people what God's doing in your home and in your life. You can't help but tell people what's going on. I've seen people healed. I've seen people, I believe, raised from close to the dead. Matter of fact, I have a friend sitting right there, Jim, that I'm telling you, I went to do his funeral. And I saw God's hand on him. That was a few years ago now. I don't even know how long, but five years ago, whoo, already. Flew from Hawaii to be with him in Oklahoma City at the hospital. And I told him when I left, I don't know when I'm coming back. I'm probably going to do a funeral when I'm there. God had other ideas. Kicked everybody out of the room. Jim and I had some talking to do. We prayed together. For a while there, everybody and their family said, when we get sick, call Denver. It didn't have nothing to do with me. It was everything to do with God. You see, when you got enough faith that God can do what he says he can do, God will heal people. It's not only that. We've seen people that things have changed in their lives. We've seen marriages that were going apart. People that were having affairs and they weren't going to go and their husband got sent somewhere else on a job. And we've seen God put them back together. And we keep track of some of them still today. They got more kids. They're happier than everything. Why? Because they didn't give up. And they said, I believe God can fix this. 
You see, the problem is we don't let God fix enough in our lives. We don't have the faith to give God the glory. And sometimes we forget what God has done for us. I'm going to go back in the ninth chapter and just share a couple of verses with you. I don't even know what time it is because my clock's not up there. You guys are in trouble. Let me look. No, not at all. <laughs> uh, going back to the 12th verse of the ninth chapter, it said when Jesus heard this, and this is talking about the beginning where we started off. When Jesus heard this, he said healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. He goes on to say, Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to, listen to this, I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. These people were all raised offering sacrifices for everything. See, it's not like it is today. They were raised offering sacrifices for everything that was going on. He said, I, don't, I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous. Folks, we got a lot of people in our churches today that think they're righteous. We got a lot of people staying at home today say, oh, I can be just as good a Christian at home as I can be around those hypocrites at church. You're lying to yourself and Satan's got you confused. In my lifetime of ministry, I have never seen anybody that could. But he said, for I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those, listen to this, who know they are sinners. Now, here's the problem. A lot of us say, well, listen, I got saved. When I got saved, Jesus washed my sins away. And that is true. But let me tell you something. That does not mean that you're not a sinner today and there's not sin in your life that needs to be taken care of by a mighty and holy God. Sometimes we're ungrateful little brats. God has taken us through things that he should have never took us through. You say, oh, but I went through all this and I went through that. But let me tell you, you're still alive to tell about it. Praise God for what he's done. It's about time we start coming to God and saying, God, forgive me. Help me, Lord, that I'll do what you ask me to do no matter what that is. Folks, I want to tell you, I've had to make some pretty hard stands in my life. And I've had people veer at me and look at me and call me names and talk about me. Guess what? It doesn't matter what matters is what God says. Let me ask you this. Does it truly matter what God says to you in your life today? Does it truly matter? Do you truly believe that God is who he says he is? Do you pr truly believe the Holy Spirit Inspired, inerrant word of God. Then how about realizing we're the sinner Jesus wasn't. He forgives us of sin and he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if you don't know my Jesus today, you can come to know him today. He died on the cross of Mount Calvary for your sin. Christian today, do you think you're a little too righteous? Oh, I don't think I'm righteous, Pastor. Oh, let you get around some real lost people and you'll act righteous. Oh, I can't believe they did that. I hear that all the time from Christians. Oh, there must be something wrong in their life. Look at them. You better quit looking at everybody else. It's that water that sh makes the ship sink. That's the world around us. And you and I can't keep looking at the world and not stay afloat. You and I have to keep looking at Jesus. And when you and I look at Jesus and thank God and give him the glory and him the praise and believe in him like a faith like none other. I want to tell you that's when we'll see the hand of God working in our lives. We're going to have a time of invitation in just a moment. Corey's going to come and lead us. I'm going to ask you to come here today. Oh, we sat through sermons like this, but let me tell you what happened. Satan's already robbing the victory in people's hearts and lives. You've had a time where you said, man, I'm, 
I haven't been trusting God enough. And Satan is telling you, oh, you've been trusting him enough. Look at so-and-so. You trust him a lot more than they do. Quit looking at so-and-so. It has nothing to do with them. It has everything to do with you and God. It has everything to do with me and God. Not anybody else. Our walk has to be between us and God. Are we willing to truly walk for him today? Do you have enough faith in him today? Do you believe that God is who he said to be? How about it, church? Do we believe that God will do what he says he will do at Stifton Baptist Church? It's about time that we settle this and say, God, not only do we say it, we believe it, and we give it all to you, almighty God. Maybe you just need to come to pray today. Maybe there's people lost today that you know they're going to go to hell without Jesus in their life. Maybe today you haven't been serving God, you haven't been trusting God, and you're going through some junk that most people don't know about. Maybe it's time to come and say, God, I'm a sinner, forgive me, help me, Lord. I need you because you're the only one that can take care of it in my life. Whatever the reason may be today, I'm going to ask you just to come. Corey's down here praying. I don't care if he ever gets up and praying. You just come right now. Everybody stand up. I just want you to step out and come. We're not, I'm not going to pray. I want you to come and give God the glory today. I about lost my voice preaching this morning. That doesn't mean I'm going to stop. If you're supposed to be down here in the front, you get down here at the front and you do what God's telling you to do. Don't listen to some dried up old preacher that's telling you what to do. You listen to the Holy Spirit tell you and show you what you need to do in him today. Would you just step out and come? Whatever's going on, it doesn't matter what it is. God can take care of it. You say, oh, but pastor, I got to go through this and I got to go through that. And, I, and, and you just don't understand. You're right, I don't understand. I'll probably never understand. But I'll tell you this, I know that my God is able We buried two children as adults. I know what it's like. This was last year. We buried a brother. I buried, we buried a niece that was part of this church. We buried a lot of people. Let me tell you, that is not the bad thing. That's a good thing. They're going on to heaven. If you're still living in that misery, it's because you haven't given over to God. There's a lot of other things that have happened. In our lives. And a lot of them I'm not going to tell you about because you'd hold them against me. And I give you enough to hold against me. But see, it's not about the water outside the ship. It's about the water that gets into the ship that sinks it. Are you willing today to do whatever God's asking you to do? Would you just step out and come? Corey, if you just lead us in song. I'm not going to hold off on day. I'm not going to beg you to come to do whatever you need to do with God. It's going to affect you more than it affects me. But don't you want what God wants for you in your life? Don't you want to see the hand of God working again? Maybe he has in the past. And maybe you're some of the people that you've just never seen it. You've just been a churchgoer all your life. I want to tell you, I'd give up going to church for one day, spending time with the Lord. Now you say, well, pastor, you just said you're supposed to come to church. Yeah, the reason I can't give up church because God says neglect, neglect not the gathering together. In Hebrews 10, 25, a lot of you and a lot of us have neglected the things of God in our life. Don't you think it's time to put it to an end? Corey, would you sing as we leave the invitation on?